The Modern Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. What's Wrong with the World by G. K. Chesterton. Part 3, Chapter 12 The Modern Slave. Now, I have only taken the test case of female suffrage because it is topical and concrete. It is not of great moment for me as a political proposal. I can quite imagine any one substantially agreeing with my view of woman as universalist and autocrat in a limited area, and still thinking that she would be none the worse for a ballot paper. The real question is whether this old ideal of woman, as the great amateur, is admitted or not. There are many modern things which threaten it much more than suffragism notably the increase of self-supporting women, even in the most severe or the most squalid employments. If there be something against nature in the idea of a horde of wild women governing, there is something truly intolerable in the idea of a herd of tame women being governed. And there are elements in human psychology that make this situation particularly poignant and ignominious. The ugly exactitudes of business, the bells and clocks, the fixed hours and rigid departments, were all meant for the male, who, as a rule, can only do one thing, and can only, with the greatest difficulty, be induced to do that. If clerks do not try to shirk their work, our whole great commercial system breaks down. It is breaking down, under the inroad of women who are adapting the unprecedented and impossible course of taking the system seriously and doing it well. Their very efficiency is the definition of their slavery. It is generally a bad sign when one is trusted very much by one's employers, and if the evasive clerks have a look of being blackguards, the earnest ladies are often something like blacklegs. But the more immediate point is that the modern working woman bears a double burden, for she endures both the grinding officialism of the new office and the distracting scrupulosity of the old home. Few men understand what conscientiousness is. They understand duty, which generally means one duty, but conscientiousness is the duty of the universalist. It is limited by no work days or holidays. It is a lawless, limitless, devouring decorum. If women are to be subjected to the dull rule of commerce, we must find some way of emancipating them from the wild rule of conscience but I rather fancy you will find it easier to leave the conscience and knock off the commerce. As it is, the modern clerk or secretary exhausts herself to put one thing straight in the ledger, and then goes home to put everything straight in the house. This condition, described by some as emancipated, is at least the reverse of my ideal. I would give women not more rights, but more privileges. Instead of sending her to seek such freedom as notoriously prevails in banks and factories, I would design specifically a house in which she can be free. And with that we come to the last point of all, the point at which we can perceive the needs of women, like the rights of men, stopped and falsified by something which is the object of this book to expose. The feminist, which means, I think, one who dislikes the chief feminine characteristics, has heard my loose monologue, bursting all the time with one pent-up protest. At this point he will break out and say, But what are we to do? There is modern commerce and its clerks. There is the modern family with its unmarried daughters. Specialism is expected everywhere. Female thrift and conscientiousness are demanded and supplied. What does it matter whether we should, in the abstract, prefer the old human and housekeeping woman? We might prefer the Garden of Eden. But since women have trades, they ought to have trade unions. Since women work in factories, they ought to vote on factory acts. If they are unmarried, they must be commercial. If they are commercial, they must be political. We have new rules for a new world, even if it be not a better one. I said to a feminist once, The question is not whether women are good enough for votes. It is whether votes are good enough for women. He only answered, Ah, you go and say that to the women chainmakers at Cradley Heath. Now, this is the attitude which I attack. 
it is the huge heresy of precedent it is the view that because we have got into a mess we must grow messier to suit it that because we have taken a wrong turn some time ago we must go forward and not backwards that because we have lost our way we must lose our map also and because we have missed our ideal we must forget it there are numbers of excellent people who do not think votes unfeminine and there may be enthusiasts for our beautiful modern industry who do not think factories unfeminine but if these things are unfeminine it is no answer to say that they fit into each other i am not satisfied with the statement that my daughter must have unwomanly powers because she has unwomanly wrongs industrial soot and political printers ink are two blacks which do not make a white most of the feminists would probably agree with me that womanhood is under shameful tyranny in the shops and mills but i want to destroy the tyranny they want to destroy womanhood that is the only difference whether we can recover the clear vision of woman as a tower with many windows the fixed eternal feminine from which her sons the specialists go forth whether we can preserve the tradition of a central thing which is even more human than democracy and even more practical than politics whether in a word it is possible to re-establish the family freed from the filthy cynicism and cruelty of the commercial epoch i shall discuss in the last section of this book but meanwhile do not talk to me about the poor chain-makers in cradley heath i know all about them and what they are doing they are engaged in a very widespread and flourishing industry of the present age they are making chains end of the modern slave